Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Noelle O'Connell and I'm the Executive Director of European Movement Ireland. A very warm welcome to you all for this afternoon's webinar on the results of EM Ireland's annual Ireland and the EU poll. This is one of our highlight projects every year. And why do we do it? Well, essentially, as a non-partisan, not-for-profit, membership-based organisation, the aim of our work is to develop the connection between Ireland and Europe and to increase awareness and understanding of European issues amongst people in Ireland. And in keeping with that mission, back in 2013, when Ireland held the EU presidency, we first commissioned Red Sea to conduct an annual Ireland and the EU poll to ascertain the views of Irish people on a range of issues concerning our relationship with the European Union. Since then, we have continued to commission Red Sea to conduct these polls in order to track the views with some of the questions in that very first poll in 2013, featuring every year. This really shines a light on how the views of citizens in Ireland have evolved on many different themes of our vitally important relationship with the European Union over this time. When work began on our 2020 poll back in late November, December of last year, and we began to plan for the questions and the timings of our report release, we were busy thinking of venues, of event format, and uh, what questions would we pose. Back then, at that stage, the word corona was more commonly associated with the band or with a beverage. Fast forward a couple of months and all has changed changed utterly. We have even included said same Corona and COVID featuring as a question in this 2020 poll. So we in European Movement Ireland have had to adapt accordingly. And our launch this year, I'm delighted to say, is, is a virtual standing room only sold out event with over 260 of you dialing in online. Our panel of speakers are located in Belfast and Brussels. And our production team is in Cork and Wicklow, and I'm in Dublin, bringing you this webinar today where we take a closer look at some of the most interesting findings we've seen in our annual Ireland and the EU polls in many a while. So in terms of our running order for today's webinar, we will hear analysis from our panel of speakers followed by a Q&A. And just a reminder, you can click on the Q&A button on your Zoom platform, submit your questions for the panel of speakers throughout the webinar, they'll be collated by my colleagues. And then after Tony and Katie's analysis, we'll get an opportunity to pose the questions uh, to the panel of speakers, and we will aim to have you all on your way by 3.30 p.m. If you want to listen back and to, to any of the webinar today, it will be available next week during Europe Week as a video and a podcast. And of course, if you're on Twitter, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag EMI Red Sea Poll 2020. So in terms of analysis and providing a little bit of background to the poll itself, this is the seventh edition. And in what is different this year? Well, many things. Firstly, it's the largest ever. It covers a broader range of questions. And it's the first poll carried out post-Brexit, which uh, I think runs through some of the responses and the results. And it's also the first one that saw polling take place in the midst of a global pandemic with people here in Ireland um, in lockdown since the end of March. Some subjects this year, like membership and defence, have the same wording as previous years. Some themes are repeated, such as tax, the EU budget and United Ireland, but with a different statement. And a number of new subjects have been introduced this year in 2020, such as the environment, refugees and enlargement. So what does the 2020 report card tell us? Well, very clearly, as we move from a BC world, that is before COVID, into a PB world, that is post Brexit, things are changing. The debate is now shifting towards what kind of a Europe people want. Very clearly, voters in Ireland want the EU to survive, but they need a sense of ownership, as the Irish Times editorial mentioned in its analysis on our poll yesterday. You've already seen the full results from the video and the presentation, so if I was to do a deep dive into all the various permutations of each of the 13 questions we asked, 
that wouldn't be very fair on, on Katie and Tony. So what I propose to do is just to take a high level look at some of the findings that jumped out at us here in EM Ireland. And hopefully you'll get an opportunity to look at some of the questions following Katie and Tony's presentations. So firstly, a regular standalone question that has featured on the front page of each of our polls since 2013, the Irish EU membership question. It's a very healthy 84%. Um, interestingly though, that is the lowest of all of our polls, but it is reflective of the level of sentiment and support of back to where we were in a pre-Brexit world, where the finding was at 85% in 2013, 86% in 2015, and 84% this year. 93% uh, broke the record books last year, and I think in large part that was reflective of the Brexit bounce when Ireland obviously featured very prominently in phase one of the Brexit negotiations. But a very respectable and solid and healthy 84% demonstrates once more that Ireland consistently ranks in the top three or so EU member states in favor of their country's continued EU membership. This year, our poll also gives us some pointers about what type of a European Union people in Ireland want. Um, we've often heard the phrase an, an a la carte EU or a pick and choose as, as Tony put it in his RT report. And essentially looking at the results and the findings, we're not that different to other Europeans. This year, and we are moving into an area that is completely different to the Brexit debates, which was all about what the EU is. Now this is about what the EU actually does. The Brexit debate had enormous influence on English language coverage of the EU. Ireland is now going to have to tr navigate a tricky path in terms of alliance building in a post-Brexit world and look at how we engage on EU issues as complex and multifaceted as budget contribution, tax, enlargement and defence no longer through the prism of Brexit with the public here in Ireland. The second substantive point that really uh, jumped out at us here in EM Ireland was the huge increase in the number of don't knows. Eight of the 13 questions that we posed had 20% of respondents with don't know, and two more questions had almost 20%. So 10 of the 13 questions were close to 20% or mo more of don't knows, which was the highest we've ever had in any of the polls. This clearly indicates a need to continue to explain and debate on what the European Union does, what kind of an EU people want, and very clearly outlines the need to sustain the momentum that went into Brexit to maintain public debate on the future of the EU. We cannot afford to take people's support or engagement or understanding for granted, and rather we need to continually work to ensure an ongoing dialogue and debate based on the facts. We don't have to look too far across the water into how a lack of debate, communication and dialogue based on the facts can take us. And also the low level of respondents that felt their voice was listened to as a citizen of the EU. Only one third, 33% felt that this was the case, 48% disagreed and 19% didn't know. These are not good results. What's particularly worrying is to see that 18 to 24 age demographic, they had the lowest level of agreement with this statement at 26%. This is further carried through with the even lower recognition of awareness on the conference of the future of the EU, with only 20% agreeing they had heard of it, 50% not, and 30% not knowing. Again, the lowest demographic who had heard about the future of the EU conference was the 18 to 24 year old cohort. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. Um, in some positive highlights, in what I'm sure will be very pleasing to our European Commissioner for Trade, this year's edition of the EM Ireland Red Sea poll found that 75% agreed that EU trade deals with other countries around the world benefit Ireland. Again, this is similar to a May 2019 Eurobarometer survey which saw 84% of those polled in Ireland believed that the EU was more effective at defending the trade interests of member states collectively than member states individually. And on the EU Commission's flagship Green Deal, again, more people had heard of it at 
with those not having heard of it at 36%, but 21% not knowing. Some other results obviously surprised us on that totemic issue of tax. An interesting finding last year in this question saw that 50% agreed that they would be open uh, to more cooperation on tax in Ireland. This year, we posed the question as to whether Ireland should give up its veto on tax at the EU table, allowing the EU27 to make decisions by majority vote. And that saw only 17% agreeing with this. So we could possibly surmise from this result that Irish people are in favour of cooperating on tax matters, but may not necessarily want the process itself to completely change. And interestingly, again, out of all the 13 questions in the 2020 poll, our question on tax saw the highest level of respondents replying to this question at don't know at 32%. Again, much food for thought. So ladies and gentlemen, these are just some of our brief but far from exhaustive observations on some of the findings of the poll. Obviously that's the challenge when you almost double the number of questions, it throws up um, a lot more uh, uh, topics to, to tease out and explore. But in that regard, I'm delighted uh, to, we have a very distinguished panel of experts here to cast their expert eye over the findings and uh, who are going to analyze and, and, and come up with fantastic um, observations on them. I'm very grateful to them both and delighted that they are here with us. Dr. Katie Hayward and Tony Connolly. It's fair to say, both of whom don't need any introduction to us all, but we, if we weren't doing this in the virtual world, we of course would have a, would have a, a, a bio of, of Katie and Tony in front of you all. So for brevity, I might synopsis and firstly say, joining us from Belfast, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Katie Hayward. Katie is a leading political sociologist based at Queen's University in Belfast. She is also a senior fellow in the UK in A Changing Europe. She has authored an impressive over 200 in, in publications, and she is widely recognized as a leading expert on all matters Brexit and the border. And as one of my colleagues uh, attributed to her here, she practically designed the much mentioned and familiar to us all Northern Ireland Protocol. So thank you, Katie, and, and very warm welcome to you. Okay. And then joining us from Brussels, as has been said, the man whose tweets make the markets move and influence international negotiations. So how about that, Tony, for a vial? Oh, RTE's Europe editor, Tony Connolly. He is no stranger to us, and, and in his brief as Europe editor for RTE, which is a, not an insignificant portfolio, both geographically and every which way else. Uh, in addition, he is an author for his must-read book, Brexit in Ireland, and is co-presenter of Brexit Republic podcast on RTE. Tony, a very warm welcome to you, and I might hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noel, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, that's, it's a great honor to have a look at this Red Sea poll uh, for the first time in, in uh, such detail uh, for me to try and parse the various answers and uh, derive some uh, deeper meaning from uh, the survey. I guess the big things that stood out for me were, of course, the membership issue, Brexit, taxation, the trade element, which Noel mentioned, uh, refugees uh, and the EU budget. But just going to the membership uh, question, first of all, again, 84%, it's pretty high. Uh, only 7% of people saying they disagree that Ireland should be members. And again, looking back at the pre-Brexit uh, era, 2015, it was 86%. So we're kind of back at normal times. Um, and, you know, we can see 93% last year in favor of membership. Last year, of course, was, I suppose, the, the real peak of Brexit antagonism. The backstop was still a major issue. Um, there, there was a much more confrontational um, approach on the backstop in terms of social media, in terms of the commentariat in the UK, uh, overall in terms of the relationship between Ireland and the UK. Um, and, you know, we had two uh, cliff edge moments last year, March 31st and October 31st. We had the triumph of Boris Johnson. We had the ERG uh, in ascendant. And I think that was why we had such a high um, 
membership uh, favorable approach to membership last year um, so that has obviously ebbed um, this year and I think it's also quite important when looking at all the answers that we see it through the prism of the coronavirus pandemic the first case was discovered in Italy on February the 20th and just a month later I think is when this uh, opinion poll was carried out between the 20th and 25th of March so the climate in Ireland was one of tremendous insecurity, fear, uncertainty about people's jobs and livelihoods. And I think that must have cast a shadow over uh, all of the results. Um, I think if you read the, the um, 86%, uh, sorry, 80, 84% in favour of membership, uh, in juxtaposition with the question of whether my voice is heard at the EU level or not, only 33% agreeing that their voice is heard, and yet 84% of people still want to remain uh, in the EU. And I think that probably suggests that people, people are differentiating between what they feel is good for them as, as a private citizen in terms of their hopes and fears and their, their needs as consumers and citizens, and what's good for the state. And I think there seems to be a settled view in Ireland that it is good for the state of Ireland to be uh, in the European Union. And it, it's probably as well um, in the context of Brexit Britain um, that our Irish people feel a stronger adherence to the EU, perhaps in opposition to, to what's going on in the UK, in, in a sense that they, they, they like this idea of differentiating Ireland from uh, from Brexit Britain. Um, to to go down to the coronavirus next um, again, what struck me about this was that people seem to have very strong views. Only seven percent didn't know whether the EU had performed well or not uh, in combating the coronavirus. Again, just reminding people of the date. Um, the, 20th of February was when the first case was discovered in Lombardy and in very early March Italy triggered the civil protection mechanism clause in the Lisbon Treaty uh, which requires member states to come to uh, the aid of another member state. Not a single member state responded to that initial uh, trigger and in the meantime Italy began to get support from China and Russia uh, and that obviously uh, completely dismantled this sacred notion of solidarity between member states and i'm sure that that fed into um to irish people's perceptions of how the eu had performed nonetheless um a slight majority of people felt that the eu have performed well uh 47 as, as opposed to 46 percent um and i find that an interesting figure and it may be that irish people are perhaps well informed of what the European Commission has been doing uh, in terms of relaxing state aid rules, relaxing the stability and growth pact rules, and then trying to cobble together a, a set of, um, of, of rescue measures, fiscal and financial instruments. And people may well also have been aware that it was individual capitals that were guilty of not uh, responding in, in, a, in terms of solidarity rather than the EU as a whole and, and, and EU institutions. Um, also, I think interesting that Ireland hasn't been one of those countries crying out for financial support during the pandemic. Yes, of course, we supported the letter written uh, by um, seven other countries or eight other countries, uh, co-signed by France and Spain and Italy, those countries in the front line of the pandemic. Uh, for corona bonds uh, and I think that was a principled uh, stand by Ireland um, and, and they would still adhere to that idea that this is an unprecedented crisis that does not involve moral hazard uh, and that the old um, calculus and rules that, that applied during the euro crisis don't apply uh, in this case. Um, going on then to whether or not the EU should allow more countries to join, 43% agreeing with that, 37% disagreeing. Um, again, I, I find this uh, an interesting finding. 43% agreeing is not a huge endorsement of EU enlargement. And it's probable that Ireland is picking up some of the, the generalized uh, fatigue with enlargement or some of the negative 
publicity around enlargement and, and how that has filtered into the, the position of the French government and so on. Having said all that, Ireland has always been deemed as one of the success stories in terms of integrating uh, citizens from other uh, EU member states uh, like Poland, like Baltic states uh, and so on. Um, so again, this could be another example of Ireland getting back to that perhaps more self-centered mainstream uh, view that, that we're getting uh, elsewhere. And also some of the uh, issues around enlargement at the moment involve countries that may not be as familiar to Ireland, like countries like Albania, North Macedonia. Um, again, that might just feed into a sense of the unfamiliar um, uh, and maybe a slightly more ambivalent attitude. Uh, whether Ireland uh, and other EU countries should take in more refugees, 53% disagreeing with that, only 35% uh, agree. I would say one of the reasons why uh, there is, again, lukewarm support for MP, uh, refugees, I was nearly going to say MEPs there, but just let me correct myself, uh, refugees, um, is that you know, back in 2014, 2015, we had nightly on our TV screens fairly harrowing images of, of men, women and children in desperate straits uh, in trying to cross the Mediterranean or trying to make it up through the Western Balkans. Uh, and that, those images are simply not there anymore because of uh, the EU agreement with Turkey uh, and uh, the efforts to, to prevent um, boats crossing the Mediterranean. Um, so I think that is probably one of the factors there. Um, but again, I would say we should see this through the lens of the coronavirus pandemic. People are in general facing a very, very uncertain future. And the unfamiliar, the alien, is always going to suffer, I think, in, in this kind of climate. Um, one finding that I found interesting was whether Ireland should be part of increased EU spending uh, on, sorry, increased EU defence and security cooperation. 49% uh, agreeing with that. I, th I find that quite interesting because, of course, Ireland has a very strong and long-standing position on neutrality. And there, I think there's always been a lot of scepticism about defence at EU level, but you've got 49% of people who think that that's a good thing and 31% disagreeing with it. Um, this, I think this could be um, a greater awareness of the much more acute polarities in the world uh, with Trump's America on the one hand, with a much more assertive China on the other hand, and the EU kind of somewhere in the middle trying to be the defender of the global multilateral order, which uh, seems under assault from all sides. So I think that may be uh, an explanation there, but uh, it, it, the question doesn't really flesh out whether Ireland should spend more or whether Ireland should uh, commit more uh, in terms of troops uh, and, and other uh, R&D uh, capabilities and so on. Um, going on into the budget, should Ireland uh, contribute more to the budget? Only 35% uh, agree, 41% disagree. Um, of course, Ireland is becoming a net contributor. Uh, we are going to be uh, on the hook for more spending. And I think perhaps the uh, huge rescue packages that are going to have to be found for the EU uh, could mean a greater contribution for Ireland in the budget. I mean, as we know, the multi-annual budget, the seven-year budget known as the MFF, is going to be the major vector of uh, the big rescue plan. So again, that could be influencing that particular uh, question. Uh, a very striking answer again on trade, as Noel mentioned, 75% uh, of people agreeing that EU trade deals around the world are good for Ireland and other member states. Um, this is interesting in the light of the widespread unease about the Mercosur deal uh, and what that would do for farming, especially beef farmers. Uh, and yet 75% is a huge endorsement of that. But again, I think this is because there have been huge debates um, via Brexit on what international trade is about and why, uh, according to many people, Britain um, uh, was mistaken in trying, in thinking that it could do better as a single country on the international stage when it comes to trade than it could as part of a block of uh, 450 million uh, people. Uh, so I think, again, that sensibility is filtering in there. Um, whether there's going to be a trade deal between the UK and the EU by the end of the year, 46% disagreeing. I think that's fairly uh, understandable. There are very few signs that there is going to be a free trade agreement at the end of the year. Uh, anyone following this uh, will have seen how difficult it has been 
uh, for any progress, uh, especially with the pandemic um, and the limitations on having uh, obviously face-to-face -face negotiations. Everything's done by video conference. Uh, as, as I've been reporting, we're only going to get another two negotiating rounds before that major rendezvous in June. Um, moving on then to United Ireland and the EU in the next 10 years, only 32% agree with that, 42% disagree. Um, yeah, I, I mean, any opinion polls about, the, about United Ireland uh, tend to be uh, very much um, unique and it's often hard to establish a clear pattern over time. Back in 2015, RT and, and the BBC produced a poll saying only 36% of people in the South uh, would support uh, a United Ireland. But yet, after the election in May last year, there was an exit poll showing 65% of people uh, in favour of United Ireland. Again, this is all mediated through the lens of Brexit. Um, and, you know, perhaps because the backstop issue and so on uh, seems to have uh, subsided in people's minds, that support or that uh, belief that a United Ireland could happen in 10 years uh, may have subsided a bit uh, as well. Um, I'm not surprised that people haven't heard of the conference in Europe, uh, on the future of Europe. Um, it hasn't been getting a huge amount of um, coverage uh, on, in the Irish media. I mean, I haven't uh, personally been able to cover it very much because uh, I've been mostly tied up with Brexit um, for RTE and then since then, obviously, the pandemic. So it hasn't really got a lot of coverage in Ireland. And perhaps people thought that the Convention on the Future of Europe years ago, the EU Constitution, the Lisbon Treaty, that had settled the constitutional position of the EU for uh, quite some time. And perhaps they don't, really don't have the appetite for another about of EU navel gazing. Um, the Green Deal, 43% having heard of it, 36% haven't heard of it, 21% uh, don't know. I think that's a fairly, a fairly good figure. Um, again, it's, you know, it's, it's been pushed out by the European Commission a lot um, at a time when Ireland was still preoccupied with uh, the, the Brexit date happening at the end of January and then straight into the pandemic after that. So I think 43% is probably a fair amount i say that's probably reflected uh, elsewhere and of course as we saw in the european elections last year uh, you know there is a, a greater awareness of green issues and uh, climate change and so on at ireland not just locally but how ireland's part of a bigger jigsaw uh, puzzle on um, combating climate change uh, globally so overall th those were the, the things that struck me um, and i'm happy now to to conclude there and uh, happy to take questions uh, later on after after Katie has spoken. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Tony. Tour, tour de force, you, you, you managed to cover, uh, run through the poll uh, in, in incredible uh, clarity and, uh, and breadth and, and really analyze some of the key findings that I wanted to touch upon, but I, I, I said I'd defer to your good self and to Katie. So delighted uh, to be joined now by Katie Hayward from Belfast. Katie, over to you. And I think you have a PowerPoint presentation, so I will leave it in your capable hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Noel. Um, so first of all, congratulations to European Movement Ireland and to you, Noel, and especially for this um, research poll, which makes such a really important contribution to our understanding of uh, where Ireland sits um, and the Irish public sits with regards to the EU. And um, as Tony emphasised, I'm very conscious that uh, taking quantitative data at a time of crisis um, brings with it certain, um, a certain need to be cautious in some ways about the results. But I would actually think it's actually particularly useful because very much we're in a time between times. We knew we were with Brexit uh, in the transition period and now of course we're all in lockdown um, with, this, with this huge sense of change um, that's kind of imminent. And so when I get to the end of my presentation, I'll have some thoughts about the bigger picture and what we can take from this really interesting uh, poll uh, to try and understand what might happen next vis-a-vis uh, -vis the big things. But in order to try and get some sense of where this data stands and what it can tell us, um, I wanted just to look at some points of comparison. So looking at comparison very briefly with the past, um, I'm interested in the past on certain things, um, comparing a little bit with other EU countries using uh, Eurobarometer data, and also looking at comparison from uh, within. Um, 
so uh, I'll just begin now um, by looking at, in particular, the support for EU membership. And this course is the headline result, I think, in that Ireland is um, very much, of course, in principle, supportive of European integration, but uh, somewhat wary, if as well as rather uninformed, you might say, um, uh, in terms of the practice of European integration. And I think that's um, a key finding that possibly tallies with um, other um, poll, polling data that we've seen for many years back in thinking of Richard Sennett's work and others. Um, so looking back in terms of the past, and, and as has been brought out by Noel and Tony already, um, we're seeing the, the, uh, the consequences of the end, if you like, of the Brexit bounce. And if we compare here in that, um, uh, that image at the corner of the data that we've seen from um, EMI Red Sea um, polls in the past, what has changed this time around and this year isn't really so much the level of support for EU membership, but the intensity of that feeling. And so people are agreeing that it's a good thing, but they're just not quite so passionate about it, which does suggest there was that, that um, impact of Brexit at the time. Um, if we can move, if we can click on the next thing, Ryan, thanks. Um, and using this um, graph from, um, I don't know how to increase the point, uh, using this graph from uh, Catherine Simpson's work to compare Eurobarometer data uh, with um, with um, Ireland's um, view of EU membership over time, we can see that Ireland, of course, has been very much a positive um, pro-European member state. Um, and we see uh, uh, in comparing Ireland to other member states that it's in the top three or so when it comes to EU membership being a good thing. But even though we see it fall down from where it was during the Brexit bounce, it's still very high there. In particular, people are saying that they have a positive image of the EU, so it conjures up warm feelings, if you like. One thing I'd note about these results in terms of the support for EU membership is that there is remarkable consistency across the population. So we don't see variations um, in education or in class as we might have seen in um, decades before. And I think that's a really striking thing and suggests that there's a very strong foundation of support for EU membership in Ireland. Um, if you click on the next one, please. So just to compare Ireland to other EU states, um, Tony has highlighted the first point I want to bring out here, which is about the handling of COVID-19. Um, we don't have across the range of barometer results, but looking at other EU um, member state polls, we see that Ireland is very much in line with those. So one in two people think that the EU is handling it okay. Um, unsurprisingly, in that data, um, we see that Italy is the country with the least um, uh, that's least impressed by the EU's handling of the matter. And it may surprise some of you to, to learn that um, the country thinking that the EU is hand, hand, who, that thinks that the EU is handling it well, with 70% uh, agreeing that that's the case, is the United Kingdom. Um, when it comes to being heard by the European Union, um, only 33% of, uh, of the respondents saying that this is the case. Um, this puts Ireland pretty much in the middle um, when it comes to um, this particular question. One thing that's really interesting is to note that this has really been plummeting, this, this, um, this sense of being heard by the EU over the past year. So in spring uh, last year, so this time last year in Eurobarometer, 69% of people um, in Ireland were saying that my voice counts in the EU. This had dropped down to 54% in the summer. And now we see in this um, poll, it's down to 33%. Now that's partly due to circumstances, as Tony has said, um, but it's also a, a worrying trend and it partly relates to Brexit, but it's also something very much to keep an eye on, I think. And just next, please. And I just wanted to mention the question of immigration. I think this is a really important uh, point not to be um, skipped over. Um, since 2014, immigration um, has been seen to be the most pressing issue for the European Union, according to the EU public. Um, and um, the answers to the question, to this particular question about whether Ireland should take in refugees, I think is worth noting, um, given the strong level of disagreement that that should be uh, the case. Um, 
and uh, it, it suggests that in some ways Ireland is in line with other with other EU um, states in that particular matter. Okay, and then the next one, please. Okay, so apologies the amount of information on this slide, but I wanted to look at try and look at with this data where are the big internal differences that lie within the country itself. So I went through to have a look at. Um, on what particular questions do we see the biggest differences according to the, the, the various um, variables. So for example, um, unsurprisingly perhaps with regards to EU defence cooperation we see the biggest difference between men and women uh, on that particular question. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So um, the United Ireland question of course isn't about whether people are in favour of it or not, but whether they expect to see it in 10 years' time. And it's really interesting that the biggest generational difference um, across all of these questions comes um, on this question with the, the younger people under 34s thinking that it's more likely to happen uh, compared to the older people. And that's interesting for several reasons, one of them being, of course, that the younger people will be the ones to be dealing with the consequences of that most um, for the longest period of time. Um, another um, uh, significant factor in relation to generational difference, um, as Noelle has already mentioned, uh, comes in relation to the progression of my voice um, is heard as an EU citizen. And we see a very big difference here between the youngest people and the oldest people, um, with only a quarter of those under 24 thinking that their voice is heard by the EU. And I think that's a really um, a, a worrying finding and one that should be really noted. Um, on the question where we see the biggest differences between classes and um, refugees is that particular matter we see um, almost um, twice the number of those in, in uh, the more wealthy classes being more in favour of it and again that's worth noting I think that's politically significant and then I also wanted to look at regional differences regional variations um, with some note of caution, bearing in mind the small n and uh, uh, therefore living with large geographical areas and small numbers. But um, bearing that in mind, a couple of things to note. First, we see the big difference between Dublin and the rest of the country in relation to a sense of voice being heard. Um, and in some of the work I did in the Irish central border region, this sense of voicelessness is very acute and that's not just in relation to, to Dublin, uh, but also relating to Brussels, and we see that drawn out here. Uh, that partly arises from a sense of peripherality, of course. And then another issue that's really interesting, I think, is that pessimism, um, possibly rightly placed, but pessimism about whether there'll be a trade deal between the UK and the EU by the end of the year. And again, we see an interesting difference between Dublin and Connacht and Ulster. Um, and given that the, the counties nearer the, the border will be um, very acutely affected, um, if not economically, then certainly in sort of um, social, political social terms by there being a no deal. I think that's another really interesting finding from this work. Um, so to conclude, I promised you I'd talk about the big picture. Um, one thing we've seen from previous um, uh, surveys in the past, particularly Eurobarometer, is that the impact of a crisis on trust and people's sense of trust the confidence in European integration and European institutions tends to have an effect after the peak of the crisis. So, uh, for example, trust in EU institutions really diminished after, um, quite dramatically after 2009, after the financial crisis really um, had hit. And uh, we can possibly expect the same to be the case in relation to trust in the EU, confidence in the EU, in the process of European integration after the, after the peak of the coronavirus crisis. Um, most, according to various polls in the EU at the moment, most people believe that the EU will be weaker after the, after the crisis. And therefore, we can assume that it's going to depend increasingly on its member states. Um, as Tony has mentioned, uh, for money and also for continued support for it, its ambition uh, to try and achieve the aims um, that have that been set out most recently for it, the new commission. And I want to conclude by reflecting on this. Um, on this polling data um, and suggesting that in some ways Ireland ex exemplifies a fundamental problem, if you like, for the future of the European Union, or at least a challenge that it needs to address. 
and that is that here we clearly have a very pro-European and friendly Euro European member states in many ways, um, full of goodwill, full of that positive image of the European Union, holding the EU in very, uh, very positive light. And yet at the same time, we see a, a certain level of lack when it comes to a, a willingness or a capacity um, in terms of resources and the level of public engagement uh, that is necessary to, um, uh, for the EU uh, in order to realize um, its very ambitious agenda and an agenda that's going to become um, increasingly difficult to achieve um, after the coronavirus crisis. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katie. Uh, an excellent uh, presentation and synopsis on, on some of the big themes that, uh, that, that we saw very much coming to the fore this year in our 2020 poll. I'm going to go straight into the questions because I'm conscious of, of time and great to see we've loads of Q&A coming in. So um, I might go to the panel first. Our first question comes from uh, Deputy Neil Richmond, and he's asking that given that EU enlargement has been quite a success for Ireland, how important is it for the future of the EU and how does the panel feel that the relatively negative opinion of this enlargement can be addressed? So in terms of the enlargement question, Tony, am I might go, go to you first on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, France's uh, declaration that they w wanted to put on ice the uh, accession of Albania and North Macedonia um, sent a very negative signal because, after all, um, the European Council had asked those countries to follow uh, a certain trajectory of preparation uh, and pre-accession uh, planning, which they had both done uh, and then to be told uh, that they, they couldn't go ahead with that uh, or that things were not going to move forward. Um, I think, you know, people who believe in the European project felt that that was a, that was a real mistake by, by President Macron. Um, and, you know, I think France got a lot of uh, criticism uh, for that. I mean, we remember 2004, the big bang, 10 new countries came in, and it seemed a very euphoric time for Europe. Uh, but euphoria has been in very short supply ever since then. We, you know, we've had one crisis after the other. We've had the financial, the financial crisis, then the euro crisis, the Greek debt crisis, terrorism, um, uh, the refugee crisis uh, and then Brexit and you know with what you know with as, as someone said you know it's it's one goddamn thing after another so uh, it, there has been very little time and space for for Europe to uh, really take a generous look at the question of of enlargement um, and you know when you see the the damage that was done to the sacred notion of solidarity um, by the initial cold shouldering of Italy, um, you know, those fundamental challenges to the EU's raison d'etre, um, you know, don't provide a very fertile, fertile playing field for, you know, for things like uh, enlargement and, you know, getting citizens signed up uh, to that kind of, um, you know, progress uh, for, for those countries. Um, again, we are also distracted by what's happening in Poland. You know, the Commission has taken legal action against Poland uh, for its um, uh, judiciary uh, policies, uh, and we've got the ongoing friction between Brussels and Hungary. And again, none of that really feeds in in a positive sense to the question of enlargement. Um, but you have to still see that enlargement is a transformative process for countries when it comes to democracy and the rule of law and the uh, the ability for countries to improve their economies uh, and their systems of government and so on yeah no great thank you tony katie did you want to come in on that question uh, i just just follow up with tony's point and say i mean bear in mind the context of this survey and the crisis i mean 20 yeah. percent people saying they don't know um so um to anticipate um all the demands that expansion of the eu would require on top of Dealing with the crisis would suggest that it would be quite a significant move, and it, I think the results aren't surprising at all in that regard. That caution. Yeah, and actually, Katie, while I was to have you on the line, I might pose the next question to you. It's and it's from Cornelia, and she asks, 
um, Katie, your opinion on how do you think the revised protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland has affected the United Ireland debate and uh, the, the United Ireland re, uh, results in our, in our poll this year. So what, what do you think of, uh, what's your take on that? Uh, in terms of how, well, I think fundamentally the, um, there's possibly a little bit of, um, we still need to see the, what the protocol actually means in practice. Um, I would sort of distinguish between how the protocol has been interpreted within Northern Ireland and in, and in the South, of course, and uh, very much, of course, the sense of the risk of that hard border question is now being lifted. Um, and that has, has possibly taken some of the, um, the real um, sense of urgency or um, intensity of the, of the United Ireland issue, um, reduced it somewhat. Um, it, I'd, I'd be slightly cautious about making any broader statements about what um, the, the, the new protocol means vis-a-vis -vis people's views on the United Ireland. Yeah, we're uh, still very early in the in the process, aren't we? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. No, great. Thank you, uh, uh, Katie. And uh, Tony, this, this one is for you uh, specifically. Um, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will give a boost to the growth of nationalism and the kind of insularity which we had seen coming before coronavirus? Or will the experience underline the reality of our global interdependence on one another and the importance of international cooperation? From, and that's from Garrett. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I guess it depends on which country you're talking about. Clearly, Italy's had a terrible tragic time with the virus and feels very bitter uh, about the initial rejection of its request for support under the civil protection mechanism. And then you had a, a very toxic and almost personalized row between Italy and the Netherlands um, over the rescue plan. Um, and, you know, the, the problem is that it, it presents the the, the real dilemma that Europe has, there's, there's no one size fits all when it comes to feeling warm about the EU because the very reason that uh, Italian citizens would feel grateful to EU membership uh, when it, in terms of solidarity and a rescue plan uh, is the very opposite uh, for Dutch citizens who obviously take a very different view uh, in terms of moral hazard and, and being on the hook for what they would see as a a country that hasn't got its act together in terms of its its uh, economic and financial situation. Um, I mean, I think we'll have to wait and see how the pandemic continues its course and how the everyone emerges from this. I mean, I think it's certainly fair to say that you know populist parties uh, haven't and, and far right parties haven't really had any answers to this. Um, I mean, you could take the view that, that Nigel Farage has taken that the pandemic shows that globalization is over, but this, you know, the, the pandemic spread simply by people getting on airplanes. So if, if, if it's your view that you people can't ever travel to other countries, then, you know, surely that's going to be an extreme and narrow view. Um, and, you know, you can see that uh, every country is taking its own, uh, particular approach. Um, the EU has been trying to catch up. So member states are very much in the driving seat when it comes to the initial response. And in general, it's the established governments in those countries that have been seen to be doing a good job. Um, and, you know, apart from perhaps Hungary, uh, you know, most governments are mainstream, um, centre-right, centre-left. Uh, they're not of that uh, particular populist ilk. Um, and you know, populists as well have had a a troubled relationship with experts. Um, there are fringes to the populist worldview which have a particular view on vaccines, and again, that's becoming a you know a, a completely um, derided view at, at this point. So you know, I'm I'm not sure that the pandemic has uh, 
meant a huge dividend for populist parties, but I would say it's still a bit early to, to conclude that. No, thank you, Tony. And you've, you've managed in your answer, I think, and I hope Pierce McHenry down in UCC would, uh, would, uh, would agree uh, on his question about the rise of the far right in, in Europe and the failure of Brussels to articulate a clear response just in terms of that future and the perceived weakness of the EU in addressing current economic aspects of the corona virus. So you've managed to do two for the price of one there, Tony. Great stuff. Um, I might go, uh, Tony, while, while you're still there, I might go to uh, Ronan McRae has a question just in terms of the budget issue um, and the budget question where we had 35%, he says, seems like quite a high level of support for higher budget contributions. Do you think Ireland's break with the Hanseatic Group on the corona bonds issue will bring about a bigger change in the Irish report, approach to the budget, apologies, and a Eurozone budget, especially as Micheál Martin has spoken in favour of a Eurozone budget in the past. Uh, thanks, Ronan. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that Ireland has completely broken from the Hanseatic group uh, definitively. Um, it was certainly noticed that Ireland signed up to what some people called, uh, you know, Club Med Plus, uh, in the letter uh, supporting corona bonds. Um, but, you know, in general, Ireland has in the past taken a pragmatic view of where its allegiances lie. Um, but it's clear that, you know, in th the past seven or eight years since the financial crisis and the, and the Irish bailout uh, has receded into view, Ireland has become a net contributor and you know, the messaging from the government, from Leo Varadkar, has always been that, of course, Ireland is prepared to pay uh, its way. You know, we're one of the more wealthy countries, well, we have been uh, up until now. Um, so it's only fair that we should uh, make our contributions according to the to the national key that we have. Um, the trouble is that all of this now goes out the window because... Um, what you pay into the budget uh, is predicated on on GNI, uh, and everyone's GNI is going to be upended now by the amount uh, of spending that governments are going to have to do to shore up economies and keep uh, companies moving and keep employers employed. So, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a while before we can say for sure what the um, you know budgetary situation is going to be for member states. I mean, clearly the European Commission. And the EU now sees the MFF as the, the main vehicle for the rescue plan, um, even though there's going to be a big debate over whether countries get loans or grants. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not clear how that's going to affect Ireland in terms of our, our budgetary commitments uh, and obligations, because, again, all of this is calculated on your GNI and, and your debt and deficit levels and so on. So uh, I hope I'm not avoiding the question, but I think it's, again, it's a bit early to say. No, absolutely. Katie, did you want to come in on that question? Oh. No, <laughs> okay, you're good. Um, Katie, just I might, I might if, and, and thank you and apologies to everyone. I think we've 16 open questions, so I'm trying to scroll through and group a, a couple together. Um, uh, Char Charles Power has, has posed the question about the disparity between EU support and the EU hearing us uh, being very alarming, particularly with young people. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the EU being in the spotlight over the last few years, we've only managed 50.66%. 50, 50 I'm slightly mithered from reading statistics all the last two weeks, so bear with me. Um, turnout at the last election. Is this a trend that will only go one way in terms of EU disengagement and support? Who should take the role in fixing this in Ireland, the EU, or should this be fought at a domestic level? And, and Katie, how would you see that from, from the North as well? And I think uh, Angela Black has, has uh, also just mentioned the EU's problem of people not caring, because I, I referenced the high level of the don't knows. How will we get real engagement when the EU is at such a physical and emotional distance from people who arguably have no intention of finding out more about the EU and take, for example, the Brexit result. Yeah, it's, it's a conundrum, isn't it? Because in many ways, like the impact of the EU, people's understanding of it is always mediated through national players, national platforms. And uh, that's possibly in some ways how it, how it should be. Um, and 
you know, the flip side of that um, is that, uh, you know, in some ways, Ireland's positive engagement with the EU has been because primarily it's um, the main political parties have been so positive about it. Uh, but at the same time, they haven't necessarily been um, allowing the EU's um, uh, like sort of direct engagement with citizens in a way that, that could possibly work and be sort of more imaginative. I think MEPs have a role to play in this particular regard. On the other hand, we see what happened in the election um, in that people didn't want the EU to be a politically important matter. Um, and um, I'm sort of slightly two minds about it because actually maybe that's a maybe that's a good thing because there are some dangers too if, uh, if the EU is too politicized as a, as a matter for debate internally. Yes. Um, but fundamentally we can't get away from the fact that uh, local and, and regional and national politicians are the ones who mediate the EU's influence and who are primarily responsible in many ways for the level of information and understanding that people have about the EU and and for their sense of having their voice heard at that level, um, that still remains an, a sort of a national responsibility. Great, thank you, absolutely. We nationalise success and Europeanise failure is, is something that we, we say a couple of times here in European Movement Ireland. I'm very conscious of the time and, and, and Tony has, a, has, a, has another appointment. That So Tony, I might ask you to, to leave if, uh, in terms of your timing if you, if you have to your other appointment sure. at three thirty. If that's if that's rather than have you miss it? I'd hate I'd hate that there was a breaking news story and it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Th thanks very much, Noel. Thanks again for the opportunity, and, and uh, thanks to everyone for listening. And sorry we couldn't get around to all the questions, but uh, uh, thanks again, and best of luck with it. We'll get you back again. Thank you so much, Tony. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. And Katie, you've kindly agreed to, to stay on for an, another few minutes, if that's okay, because questions are coming in. So um, if people are, and people are still uh, uh, dialed in, which is, which is great to see. Um, Jonathan Mills has posed the question, Katie, um, which might be an interesting one for you. Um, in terms of um, uh, the Brexit deal, right, and that question that we posed, are EU officials positive about a Brexit deal by the end of the year? And what sort of deal are they expecting? Are uh, EU officials? Yeah. Um, come back, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, my understanding is that no, they're not positive about it. I, I don't think, I mean, we can even see that publicly from what Barney says. Um, so um, all the signs are publicly and perhaps privately too that um, we are not on course for a deal at the end of the year. Um, and uh, a lot has to change um, between um, now and June if, if, we could, if, that, if that is going to uh, change in any substantial way. Um, and of course, um, meeting today is the specialised committee on, on has met already on, on the protocol yeah. on Ireland, Northern Ireland, and they were. You know, that's a really important committee um, uh, looking at uh, the implementation of the protocol, and it's wanting to see substantial movement in that regard and of course it's highly politically sensitive because it would involve preparing for border controls between North Ireland and Great Britain. Um, yeah. But this is this fascinating conundrum that, which we're in now in that the border has moved. The border issue and problem hasn't been resolved at all, it's just been moved. Um, and uh, the UK has shown very little sign of seriously engaging with that uh, and the implications of it. Um, not just in public, but also in, in private too, and really preparing itself for, for the consequences of, of implementing the protocol. Hence, EU officials are very sceptical, I think, about likely yeah. the likelihood of a protocol outcome. No, no, and apologies, we, 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 uh, it, Tony escaped that one, but uh, <laughs> he, he, he had to leave. Um, uh, Katie, one specifically actually for you, uh, Donald Dunham has posed a very interesting question and one that is featuring in the, in the newspapers uh, this week, in fact, um, particularly. Uh, should the EU have a diplomatic office resident in Belfast? Hmm. So it's important to distinguish between the technical office and the diplomatic office. Okay. 
So um, we would expect the EU to have a technical presence in Northern Ireland after, um, uh, after the end of the transition period. Um, and this is according to the protocol. Uh, and this would cover a lot of things, obviously customs, but also um, tax expertise, for example, um, and a wide range of other areas, including sort of veterinary um, standards, et cetera, medicine. This kind of thing, like quite substantial technical presence to make sure that um, the UK is properly implementing the protocol because the EU does have concerns about um, what failure to properly implement it would look like in, for the single market. Um, so the EU is concerned to see that and it believes that the UK has signed up to it. Um, uh, there is this question of, well, what does that presence look like? Does it have to be permanent? Um, the UK, uh, Penny Morton wrote a letter this week saying it, it, if, if, the U, if the EU has a presence, it should be just um, on a sort of pay-as-you-go basis. It would come in, fly in, fly out, or however you're going to get to Northern Ireland after all this is over. Uh, and um, that it won't necessarily be fully there. Um, I did their full time and I did a, some research on this with my colleague David Finnamore. And really, uh, the I think there's a lot of concern that actually the EU presence, if it happens at all, shouldn't just be technical. It's important that it has a diplomatic presence too, because Northern Ireland's position will be so completely transformed um, by the implementation of the protocol um, in that it will be very much a rule taker. And if it has a, if the EU has a diplomatic office in Belfast, it would be one means of ensuring that the EU has a more nuanced understanding of concerns in Northern Ireland as well as Northern Ireland is having some small channel by which it can, it can um, uh, if not shape and at least inform decisions that are being made that might have directly affected. So yeah. the, the, the debate that's happening at the EU level, EU, UK level is about the technical presence. The diplomatic presence is one that is possibly more important for Northern Ireland but is, is um, really not on the cards at the moment. Yeah, and I think Donald is saying that's why he used the word diplomatic. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, thank, thank you, Donald, for that. And uh, I'm going to give the honour of the last question to the last question that has come in, and that's from uh, Cahill McQuilla. Um, and Cahill has asked you, Katie, whom we all know. Uh, hi, Cahill. Um, does Katie think the tensions in the executive on handling the COVID crisis will have a serious lasting effect, number one, generally, and number two, in relation to Brexit? So it's always, I, yes, there are tensions and there have been party differences um, and there has been some exploitation of those differences politically, but I would be inclined to emphasize the commonality. I think the executive has been under enormous strain and most simply we've seen it in terms of, you know, do you follow the island of Ireland? Is that your, your sort of unit or is it the UK? and uh, Northern Ireland has suffered the consequences of that very fundamental tension. And that, of course, is a tension posed by Brexit itself, where does Northern Ireland sit vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ireland and, um, and Britain. And I think, although publicly we are well aware of, um, sort of differences and tensions, actually, overall, the executive has worked pretty well. And um, I think there's a level of I would go so far as to say mutual respect between the first minister and deputy first minister that is emerging through this that is uh, that wasn't there before and a sense of common commitment to northern ireland's interests which is good to see now when this is over and we have this the brexit you know the full impl in, um, implications of the protocol really coming into play then possibly we'll see the tensions re-emerge but i would be more positive um, uh, than some others about that particular question. Glass half full. <laughs> well, <laughs> you live in hope, don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> you well, live up there, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I think at these, at these difficult and challenging times, we've all got to grasp and clutch every bit of hope that we can, isn't, isn't that, I think, fair to say. Mm -hmm. um, ladies and gentlemen, I think, Katie, thank you so much. Um, I think what I'll do is now, um, and with a sincere apologies, we had something like 26 questions uh, coming in and
and uh, Tony had a very hard uh, timeline of, of, of 3.30, so I was very conscious of that. So apologies to those, those of you that I didn't get to reply to all your questions. I promise if we do this again, we might just start with the questions and, and have Katie and Tony answering those and, and tease it out further. But if I could just, um, a big thank you to our fantastic panelists of uh, uh, Katie and Tony for their expert and incisive knowledge, expertise, analysis, and synthesis of, of EM Ireland's Red Sea Poll. We were very grateful and appreciative of, of Katie and Tony's time and preparation that they put into today's webinar. So big thank you to them. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in the virtual world, <laughs> Bula Boss Katie. Mm -hmm. and, and a big thank you as well to, if I can on my own behalf, um, to my incredibly hardworking uh, team here in European Movement Ireland, who have done absolutely Trojan work in the publication, dissemination, promotion, and of our annual Red Sea Poll. Um, it was a, a, a mammoth uh, task for us here in EM Ireland, and uh, thank, on my own behalf, I would like to thank them, and in particular today for, for our webinar and pulling it all together. Thankfully, technology uh, kept, kept us all uh, afloat, which is hugely important in these times. And if I could thank and pay tribute to all of you who um, dialed in and uh, watched this webinar online, um, very appreciative of all your support and engagement. These are crucial times in Ireland's relationship with the EU, and it's a crucial time for all of us and all of your families and loved ones. And I do hope you are keeping well and safe. And as we look forward to Europe Week and Europe Day uh, next week, it's uh, another busy week, um, the 75th anniversary of the Schumann Declaration, European Movement Ireland is going to be having our next webinar on Wednesday, the 6th of May at 11 a.m., when we're delighted to be joined by Irish member of the European Court of Auditors, Tony Murphy, who's going to talk to us about the important work that the European Court of Auditors does and uh, talk us through some job opportunities uh, that might be of interest to you. But again, thank you all very much for your participation and contribution in today's webinar. Stay safe, stay well, and hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you, goodbye.